Well, good morning, everyone. How's everybody doing? How's everybody doing? Hello. We're here to worship together. Welcome. We're glad that you're here. I'm Chris Lee. I'm one of the worship leaders uh, here at First Church. Why don't you stand as we get started worshiping in song together? Right. 
have a seat. Welcome, welcome. We're so glad you're here. I'm Chris Lee. Um, I'm one of the worship leaders here, and it's so good to see some new faces this morning. Um, we, uh, we worship at the same time as the early, the uh, late traditional service upstairs. If you're visiting with us, uh, we have a couple of different Sunday morning worship opportunities uh, that you can check out. Well, if you did not, uh, if you have not yet done it, on the center aisle um, is a, an attendance registry pad. If you will grab that, um, and first thing, before you grab a pen, uh, even, there are some name tags in the front. We're trying something new. We know some of you in here have been worshiping here for years. Um, and we're so glad that you're here. We love you and we care about you, but we also have um, people who are visiting with us um, or haven't been worshiping here for that long. And it is really helpful to us um, on staff, but also uh, to each other to have name tags on so that, so that um, instead of like just guessing, um, we can say, Mike, um, we're so glad that you're here this morning, or Matt, uh, we're, we're glad you came to worship with us this morning. So if you will help us by putting on a name tag, uh, that'll help um, us be more welcoming uh, than, than we already are. Um, so thank you for helping us out in that way. Um, and then if you will uh, sign that, that uh, pad and pass it on down so that we can see who we were worshiping with this morning. And if you want to share any information with us, we would love to be in community and relationship with you more than just, you know, this morning or an hour or two on a Sunday morning. We have a lot of things that are going on in the life of this church. Um, also, there are a couple of announcements that I want to point out this morning. Um, first of all, um, some of you have participated in other ways in this um, at other times of the year um, or at other places. Um, but CARM, Knox Area Rescue Ministries, does a program called Coats for the Cold that we are participating in this year. And uh, this is one of the locations. This church is one of the locations. And so um, if there are, co you, you've been getting ready for, you know, coming to church today. 
um, and you realized that it was freezing this morning as you were getting ready, um, and you noticed there's a coat in there that you haven't worn in a few years, um, but it's still a good coat, um, and you would like to donate that to CARM, there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people every winter in the greater Knoxville area that are outside, homeless, and freezing. Um, and having a coat makes a huge difference. Um, so if you're able to donate one coat or ten coats, whatever you're able to do, um, you can bring those in today um, or next Sunday or throughout the week. But please bring in coats that we can donate to CARM. That helps us out a lot. And also, the last Sunday of this month is our annual fall festival. It's our largest event of the, of the year. Um, we want you to be a part of it. If you have not come before, come. Uh, we have trunk or treat. We have blow-up uh, inflatable games. Uh, we have food, uh, the whole nine yards. It's uh, from 2 to 5. Yes. Uh, it's from 2 to 5 um, the last Sunday of this month, and it'll be in the upper parking lot on this side, the large parking lot. Uh, everything will be up there. There's also a little train that little kids will ride on through the parking lot. There's a lot of fun stuff. Uh, so come be a part of that. And if you would like to volunteer, um, my goal this year uh, that I've charged the church with is 30 cars in the, um, in the trunk or treat area. Last year we did not hit 30, and I think we can. So uh, if you would like to volunteer to have a, a car or a trunk for trunk or treat, you can see me or Miss Denise, uh, somebody in the uh, children's ministry. Uh, we will get you signed up. Um, and Miss Denise can tell you more uh, details about that if you're interested in that. Or you can sign up on our website, firstchurch.org, um, at backslash fall festival. So go sign up there. That is the easiest way to sign up to be a volunteer or participate in some way. Well, as you see in the bulletin this morning, there are a lot of things going on in the life of this church, not just those two things. Um, and we want you to be a part of this community uh, more than just right here in this room uh, on a Sunday morning. So if there are other ways that you're wanting to get involved, uh, we have a lot of mission opportunities uh, every single week. Um, and if that's something that you're looking for um, during the day or in the evenings, um, we have lots of different opportunities. So find me after the service. We will find a way to get you plugged in if that's what you um, would like to do. Well, as we uh, continue to worship God, uh, let's go to God in prayer. Lord, thank you so much for this day and for this chance to get to be here in this place. For you alone are worthy. And I pray that you would move in this place. We know that you are here, but we ask that, that you would stir in us. Meet us where we are this morning and because you alone know exactly what we need. And may we be open to all the ways that you want to work in us this morning. Speak to our hearts. Um, change our lives in such a way that when we leave this place this morning, um, we leave bolder and with a renewed spirit from all that you have done and all that we've experienced this morning. We love you, Lord. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Well, why don't you stand back up with us as we continue worshiping the song? The tide is turning, this is redemption's hour In the midst of a world lost for love, you are all we have now the lost returning, salvation is all around. In the midst of a world broken down, you are all we have now. For you are God and this hope is ours. So Father, open the skies, flood the earth with your light. This is love to break a world in
Good morning, church. Let's turn our hearts to the Lord for a time of prayer. Dear God, we thank you for your sweet spirit in this room today. We thank you for your sweet spirit in our lives every day. Uh, we ask in this moment that you make us more aware of your movings. I ask that you pour out your blessings on Greta as she prepares to give your word. We thank you for the work you are doing, not only through this time of worship, not only through this building and these people that we call the church, but through this community. I ask that you make us more aware in this moment of how we can be your hands and feet as the weather changes, as seasons of life change. Help us to be your hands and feet so that we can change hearts towards you. Dear God, as we are in your presence, help us to remember that we are forever in your presence, not only gathered here on Sunday morning, but every moment of every day. We give you thanks for these things. In your son's sweet and holy name, we pray. Amen. So what I'm going to do now is ask the ushers to come forward, and we are going to continue our worship with our tithes and offerings. people who uh, <laughs> don't remember those songs, uh, <clears throat> like me. Um, uh, if there are any kids who would like to go to Kids on Worship, uh, now is that time. Um, Julie, are you taking me? Uh, you can make your way back to Miss Julie. She will take you to um, Kids on Worship.
Well, good morning, church family. Uh, it is such a joy to be with you worshiping every Sunday. It is a special honor to be with you sharing this morning. Um, I've uh, been a member of this church for 20 some years um, and have been um, called out of this church. Um, into ordained ministry. I'm pursuing um, a seminary education right now and ordination as a deacon in the United Methodist Church. And so um, I can't stand here without just thinking about all that God has done um, in my life and in our lives together as a community of faith. Um, so it is, it is a joy to be with you. Um, and to be sharing with you as we continue in this series, The Faces of Our Faith, um, this is a series that we've been doing. We did it a little while ago, and they've come back to it in um, October after taking a break and looking at some um, of our United Methodist membership vows. And the, the thought is we're going to look at some important figures in our faith um, history, in our, in, our, in our Bible stories, who we don't hear about a whole lot. Um, and Esther, and along with her Vashti, are two of those people. Um, when I was reading, getting ready for today, I learned that if you follow the lectionary, Esther only gets preached on once every three years. And, yeah, and, um, and on only certain parts of it. So um, I, I'm going to be looking at one of those parts this morning, but um, I want you to, to, um, to know that, that this is a... Um, a special time to, to think about those minor characters. All right, well, I'm going to begin um, with reading part of the scripture that I want to, to focus on from Esther this morning, and it is found in chapter 4, um, beginning at um, verse, I'm trying to see what verse 12 you have up there, okay. All right. When they told more, I'm actually, I started at verse 10 this morning when I read this, and I'm going to go ahead and do that, and then you can follow along starting at verse 12. Um, Mordecai has come to Esther and um, told her that her people are in grave danger, and this is what she said or she, through a messenger. Esther spoke to Hathak and gave him a message for Mordecai, saying, All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that if any man or woman goes to the king inside the inner court without being called, there is but one law. All alike are to be put to death. Only if the king holds out the golden scepter to someone may that person live. I myself have not been called to come into the king for 30 days. When they told Mordecai what Esther had said, Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, Do not think that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. For if you keep silence at such a time as this, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another quarter, but you and your father's family will perish. Who knows? Perhaps you have come to royal dignity for just such a time as this. Then Esther said in reply to Mordecai, Go. Gather all the Jews to be found in Susa and hold a fast. Do not eat or drink for three days, day or night. I and my maids will fast also as you. After that, I will go to the king, though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. Mordecai then went away and did everything as Esther had ordered him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Hannah said goodbye to her eldest son with a kiss and a prayer that he would make it to the border alive. He was but 17, the same age she had been when she gave birth to him. Looking at him now, she still saw the round little baby face, the sparkling eyes she had nursed into sleepiness on countless nights. She traced his cheek with her hand. Perhaps her fingers would remember his face. She had nothing to offer him for the long and treacherous journey ahead, nothing but a cup of buttermilk and all her hopes and dreams. 
It was as if she draped them around his shoulders like the tattered wool of his coat. It is only by hope, after all, that a mother says goodbye to her eldest son and sends him off on an uncertain journey of a thousand miles. There was little hope left here, that much was certain. He was as likely, if not more likely, to die in this country of his birth, of starvation, violence, illness, Scraping together the means to send him off with a kiss and a prayer and a cup of buttermilk was, yes, both an act of love and hope, but also one of desperation. She knew that she would never see him again, but perhaps that would be easier than watching him die in front of her. I imagine he promised her that he would be strong and that he would be smart. And then, I imagine, he promised her something that they both knew he had no right to promise at all, that he would be safe, that he would make it to a new beginning. You might think that this story was plucked out of today's headlines. It could easily be the story of a boy making the long and arduous journey across the desert to the border between the United States and Mexico, or it could be the story of a Syrian mother entrusting her oldest son to the smugglers who captained flimsy rafts across the Aegean Sea. But the border in this story is the port of Philadelphia. The treacherous journey is the crossing of the Atlantic Ocean, and the year is 1793. Hannah's son, Robert Fleming, who immigrated to the United States from Ireland that year at the age of 17, was my great, 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 great grandfather. And I, as I was writing this, I thought about how I graduated from college in Virginia exactly 200 years after Robert made that fateful journey. And I stand here today, the embodiment of a mother's hopes, not only for her son, but for her people. I share this story with you because when I'm tempted to read today's headlines of the immigrant or refugee crisis and either blame those people for their trouble or to distance myself with pity, those poor people, Hannah and Robert remind me that their story is my story. Those people, those people, those people, those people are my people. We are in America in the midst of a crisis of those people, and by that I'm not referring to immigrants or refugees or any particular people group, but to our growing national tendency to summarily dismiss entire groups of people as fundamentally different from us, responsible for the problems we see in the world, even dangerous and most disturbingly unworthy of dignity and basic human rights. It is tempting when we are unhappy with how things are or uncertain or fearful about the future to look for someone or a group of someones to blame. It is likewise too easy for those of us in a position of relative comfort or privilege to distance ourselves from those who are vulnerable with the words, that's really too bad for those poor people. We can see similar dynamics at play in the story of Esther. There are themes of power and fear, insecurity and control, privilege and oppression. There is a power-hungry, manipulative, and influential leader whose dangerous rhetoric about a certain group of people, those people, results in an order of genocide, and all of these themes converge upon a hero with a hidden identity who faces the moral dilemma of whether to reveal that identity at great personal risk. There is this great defining moment in the book of Esther. There is a moment that begs the question, will Esther stand with her people? The story of Esther hinges on a those people are my people moment. The book of Esther is unique in the Old Testament. In fact, it's unlike any other book in the Bible. 
Scholars over the course of centuries have not quite known what to do with it. Martin Luther reportedly stated he wished it had never been written. It is an odd addition to the stories of the Old Testament and its purpose in the canon has been widely debated. As many commentators have noted, God is not even mentioned in the book of Esther, which is not to say that God is not a character in the story. Even though God is not identified directly, there are allusions to divine intervention and there are coincidences that suggest to the reader the unseen hand of God. The historical context suggests that King Ahasuerus refers to the Persian king Xerxes I in the 400s BCE, but there's no corroborating historical evidence to suggest that Queen Vashti or Queen Esther ever existed. There's no evidence of a Jewish queen in Persia's history at all, and so most biblical scholars refer to the book of Esther as a work of historical fiction. In fact, it reads more like a Shakespearean play than a historical account. It is full of exaggeration and innuendo, multiple reversals and slapstick comedy, even though, as Old Testament scholar Carol Bechtel points out, sometimes in the book of Esther, we're laughing so that we don't cry because the subject of the book is no laughing matter. What we know about the book of Esther is that it is the story of a people. It is a story with rich tradition. It is a story that was meant to be told again and again, commemorated by being read aloud yearly at Purim, a lively feast celebrating the deliverance of the Jews from the Persians. In fact, it has been suggested that the name of God is not mentioned in the book of Esther so that the Jews, who might be celebrating a little too exuberantly, would not slip up and unintentionally utter God's name out loud. Here's the story. A king is throwing a party, but not just any party. A party within a party. A party that is the most lavish and raucous party that you could possibly imagine. The author uses a lot of exaggeration to help us understand how excessive this party is. Everyone who is anyone has been invited. The festivities last for 180 days. That's half a year. And the guests are treated to every extravagance. But even this is not enough. The king then throws a second, more lavish party, smaller, for the distinguished officials of the palace. And we're told that his male guests are, are encouraged to drink without restraint. Into this unrestrained celebration, King Ahasuerus summons at last the culmination of the party, his prize possession, his queen Vashti for display. Only there is one problem, Vashti refuses to come. Now we're not told why Vashti refuses the king, but it does not take a lot of imagination to guess. 187 days of unrestrained drinking and raucous partying by the most powerful men in the kingdom. Would you go? Would you send your wife or sister or daughter? Well, as we might expect, King Ahasuerus is livid, but he doesn't know what to do. For a king, he doesn't seem to have much real power or leadership ability at all. He's really portrayed in this narrative as kind of a buffoon. But after exaggerated consultation, he issues a royal decree. Vashti's refusal is characterized as an affront not only to the king, but to all men in the kingdom. She will never enter the king's presence again. We're not exactly told whether Vashti is killed or only banished, but she is certainly stripped of her status and her power. Moreover, women all over Persia will suffer the consequences of her refusal. Every woman in the kingdom is now declared to be subject to her husband as her master. So the search begins for a new queen. Esther, a Jewish girl living in exile in Persia, is one of the beautiful young virgins rounded up by the authorities 
and brought to the palace for a year of preparation before spending one night with the king. Her uncle Mordecai, who has raised her as his own daughter, advises her to keep her Jewish ancestry a secret, not to reveal her kindred or her people. Esther obeys. A smart girl, she proves again that she's willing to seek and accept good advice when her one night with the king arrives. Each girl is given the opportunity to take one item with her when she goes to please the king, and Esther relies on the advice of the king's eunuch, the keeper of the harem. Apparently, Esther makes quite an impression on Ahasuerus because she is chosen to replace Vashti. Mordecai, who never stops seeking news of Esther and who seems to always have his ear to the ground, now learns of a plot to kill the king. He gets word of the plot to Esther and the assassination attempt is foiled. But instead of promoting Mordecai, the next chapter of the story begins with a promotion for an unknown character named Haman. When Mordecai refuses to bow to Haman, Haman becomes enraged and begins plotting his revenge. He tricks the king into ordering the annihilation not only of Mordecai, but of the Jews scattered throughout Persia. His words are eerily familiar, the kind of language that has been used throughout recorded history to incite violence. A certain people, he says, is breaking the law and it cannot be tolerated. A certain people, those people. The order is to kill and annihilate all Jews, young and old, women and children. Now Mordecai, in deep grief and worry, is appealing to Esther to intervene on behalf of their people. Now keep in mind that the story of Esther takes place over a time period of about 10 years. So Esther, by this time, has been living in the king's palace, having hidden her Jewish identity for many years. To make matters worse, if we, as we've seen, this is the second decree, the second order we've heard about in the story. The first was that order sent throughout the kingdom declaring every man to be master in his own house and wives throughout the kingdom to be subject to the demands of their husbands. In an ironic reversal, Vashti's refusal to come when King Ahasuerus called for her has made it especially dangerous for Esther to approach the king unless she's called. Vashti's predicament reminds us that Esther is doubly vulnerable in her position as a woman and a Jew. We know, as the readers, how dangerous it is for Esther to cross the king. What will she do? Living in the palace, she has risen above her status as an exile and an orphan. How she achieved that status is something we'd prefer not to think about, but she has attained a position of influence. Now Esther has a choice to make whether to remain separate from her people in an attempt at self-preservation or whether to identify with her people, stand with them, and risk death. Mordecai's words to her remind her and us that choosing to remain separate is not necessarily choosing safety. There is no guarantee of safety in her position. His words are stark but true. Do not think that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. They are much like the words I read recently from Lindsay Stonebridge, a professor and scholar in England speaking about the refugee crisis of today. She says, when you have a refugee crisis, what you also have is a political, existential, and moral crisis about what a country is and who its citizens are. So if you stop to think about it, when you're a refugee, you become a refugee just by where you happen to be born and when you happen to be born. That's it. It's the accident of birth, so it's purely contingent. And I think there's something about that contingency people really do find threatening. So that's why we get people sort of somehow imagining where they happen to be born entitles them to more than someone else who happens to have been born 
somewhere else. Of course, the great irony in that way of thinking is that if human rights are contingent upon where or when you are born, upon nationality or race or ethnicity or belonging to any certain group, then we are all more vulnerable, not less. Think about that. If we perpetuate a world in which freedom, dignity, and basic human rights only belong to those with a certain status or citizenship, we can all easily lose those basic rights. Status changes, governments and countries fall. Do not think, Mordecai says, that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. Do not think that in the king's palace you can escape. Esther must have been convinced because the next words she speaks are words of unity with her people. Let us fast together, she says. Then I will go to the king, and if I perish, I perish. Those people are my people. Now, Esther is not rash and emotional in her pleas for her people. She is keen and systematic. She constructs her appeal carefully. And while her appeal does finally result in Haman's downfall and prevent the annihilation of her people, it does not happen without a fight. When I read the book of Esther, I always want to rewrite the story. I always forget. I want the king to cancel the order of genocide but that's not what happens. Instead, a second decree gives the Jews a chance to defend themselves. They are successful, but not without a fight. That's another lesson for another day, and also one we need to learn if we're to be advocates for change on behalf of the most vulnerable. But for our focus today, what's most important is that once Esther has made up her mind, once she has remembered that these are her people, her identification with them is complete. When she finally gets around to making her request of King Ahasuerus for the salvation of her people, this is what she says. And this is from chapter 7. Then Queen Esther answered, If I have won your favor, O king, and if it pleases the king, let my life be given me. That is my petition and the lives of my people, that is my request. For we have been sold, I and my people, to be destroyed, to be killed, and to be annihilated. And I'm gonna stop there. Now why is any of this important to you and me as followers of Christ? The book of Esther is a salvation story that depends on the identification of a queen with her people. Hear that again. The book of Esther is a salvation story that depends on the identification of a queen with her people. And if you and I wonder how it applies to us, then we should remember that we are recipients of another salvation story the gospel of Jesus Christ is a salvation story, one that depends on the identification of a king with his people. Jesus Christ is God's. Those people are my people to the world. Our redemption is found in God's willingness to identify with our suffering rather than abandon us to it. Throughout the Bible, in these stories which anchor our faith and tell us about who God is and what God does, if you want to see God at work and to know God's heart, here's a safe bet. Look for the suffering. Look to the ones who are oppressed, marginalized, persecuted. God hangs out with them. God hangs out with those people. So the question for you and for me today is will we follow the example of Esther? Will we follow the example of Christ? 
Will we look to the ones around us who are suffering, marginalized, oppressed, and will we dare to join them by saying, those people are my people? Perhaps we should remember the words of Mordecai to Esther. If you keep silent, salvation will come to the people from another quarter, but you and your family will perish. Who knows? Perhaps we were appointed for just such a time as this. Amen.
people of God, as you go forth to serve God's people, I want to leave you with this benediction as I think of Hannah and Robert. May the road rise up to meet you. May the wind be always at your back. May the sun shine warmly on your face and the rains gently on your fields. And until we meet again, may God hold you in the palm of his hand. Amen.